In today's video, we're going to take an inside look at Carl Huna's Slavic Fantasy. I'll provide some background information and performance tips section by section on this iconic trumpet piece. Whether you're performing this piece for the very first time or thinking about programming it, or if you're a teacher coaching this piece with a student, you'll want to stick around to the end as I'm hopeful this will be a valuable resource. Real quick before we get back into Slavic Fantasy, the good folks at Hot Audio sent me the QDZ Bluetooth wireless speaker that I've been using while I practice. It's small, portable, and it works really well for a metronome, practicing with drones, or listening to music that you may be studying. It fits inside your trumpet case, and I'm using it all of the time. The waterproof Bluetooth speaker is compatible with iPhone, iPod, tablets, Samsung Galaxy, and many other devices. It has a deep bass sound, colorful lights, and a suction cup that is strong and will hang on any smooth surface such as a wall, glass, and desk. You can even use it in the shower. The lanyard makes it easy to carry around and I love the portable nature of this speaker. It's only $25 and you can get yours in the link in the description below. And now back to some background and performance tips on Carl Huna's Slavic Fantasy. Karl Huna, whose dates are 1871 and 1934, was a German cornet soloist and composer that wrote works for brass, but is best known for the piece Slavic Fantasy that he wrote for cornet virtuoso Franz Werner in 1899. In addition to his performing and composing, Huna wrote a treatise on cornet performance. About 10 years ago, Q Press published his book with the English translation. I'll include a link to that book in the description below. In his 171-page Grand Method, Huna writes in his foreword that he's observed that the methods currently available all have serious fault, and that they assume that the student has strength to play too much too soon, causing them to lose interest. So it is with this that Huna writes a method which aims to answer the demands of the cornet with a systematic and gradual development of the student. Slavic Fantasy showcases the cornet's expressive capabilities. It demands both technical proficiency and musicality from the performer. Before we dive into the piece, I want to address whether or not we should use the cornet or trumpet to perform this piece. Obviously, you hear it done both ways. Because of the context of the piece that I mentioned earlier, I choose cornet. That seems odd coming from me considering I vowed to never play a cornet again when I left the Air Force Band, unless I absolutely had to, of course. I've sort of come back around on the cornet and find it to be a really good fit for this particular piece. In the opening cadenza, you want to start this with a bang. It's marked with energy. My general approach with written out cadenzas is to play with freedom, but still be able to conduct along so that it makes good musical sense. The moderato should be in time as there are some piano inflections throughout the line. Traditionally, this line ends with a slowdown. In the fourth line, we are right back in with a cadenza. Make sure to check the score and know where the piano chords are throughout this section. In the Adagio, I like to start this with a true piano. Since this piece is so romantic, this will give us more contrast and room to be expressive. Note that the accompaniment is in a triplet feel throughout this entire section. Also in the section, the tempo should be romantic as well, as the composer has specific instructions to rush at times and to relax the tempo at other times.
at the moderato, we pick up the tempo a little bit. At the double bar, feel free to be soloistic on the first three beats as the piano just has a chord beneath you and then rejoins you in time for beat four. Also notice the tempo markings to rush and to relax throughout this section as well. In the tempo di Mazurek, we pick the tempo up even more still. Work to keep the triplets light toward the end of this section as it's marked piano with staccatos. On the last two notes of this section, you may consider shortening up just a little bit on the octave B flats as it seems to help with the technicality of that lick. In the andante toward the bottom of the second page, I like to approach this with sort of a Slavic character, infusing elements of Eastern European folk music. Again, notice the markings to rush or accelerate the tempo at times and to relax the tempo at times. In the Vivace section that starts at the bottom of the second page, good luck. From here to the end requires a lot of slow practice and technique building. I think a tempo of quarter note equals 144 to 152 is appropriate. Certainly you will hear performers like Hocken Hardenberger, Doc Schitzer, and Elmer Cherampi go beyond that tempo, but I think they're just showing off a little bit, or maybe I'm just a little envious. Notice the marking in the fourth line of the third page. My interpretation is that the first time through the passage is marked forte and slurred. The second time through that same passage is marked pianissimo and back to the slur two tongue two that we did in the previous section. At the double bar and the last measure of the fourth line, I like to start this section slower and accelerate throughout that section to set up the next section that is marked Immer Schneller, meaning more quickly. The adagio toward the end provides a lot of contrast to both what happens before and after. Play a true piano here. I like to treat the last note in this section almost like a fermata to set up the prestissimo. On the ending, although it's not marked, a slowdown here seems appropriate. If you have any questions about my interpretation of this piece or about the piece in general, don't hesitate to reach out in the comments below. 
If you find value here, hit that like button and consider subscribing to this channel. Thanks for watching and happy practicing.